So um, what I want to do today is talk about um, what FDA's activities have been regarding processed form compounds, uh, namely acrylamide, furan, NMCPD, and glycidyl esters. Uh, also talk about codex activities, uh, and I was asked to talk a, a little bit about what other regulatory bodies are doing with respect to these compounds. So to the extent that I can, I will weave that in as well. So starting off with acrylamide, um, just a bit of background. I think not, none of this is new to you. Um, uh, we're, of course, concerned because it's a neurotoxicant and a potential human carcin carcinogen. Uh, first reported in 2002. Actually, you know, everybody refers to that as the first discovery, but had we been scanning the uh, literature, uh, there were indications that acrylamide does form um, during heating processes in foods. But that's when uh, it, it became, it just blew up. Uh, <clears throat> so it's formed uh, through the reaction of uh, asparagine and uh, reducing, uh, reducing sugars. It's found in a wide range of foods, as, as Mike indicated, um, and including dietary um, staples, which really makes mitig mitigation a challenge. Uh, so, since the discovery, uh, there have been a lot of activity worldwide, um, new safety evaluations and assessments. Um, our National Center for Toxicology Research um, alone has done, you know, so many studies on acrylamide and this metabolite glycidamide. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there's been a lot of government and industry research, new toxicity studies, as I just mentioned, uh, food surveys. Um, and exposure assessments, which uh, Mike spoke about. Uh, and there have been a lot of acrylamide mitigation research. We've actually interacted with industry quite a bit, and industry has been coming in uh, to talk to us about what they've been doing to mitigate <coughs> acrylamide. Sometimes getting uh, really um, significant reductions in their products. Um, and of course, there's been a lot of um, FDA activities, which I'll be talking about. Uh, if you want information on acrylamide, this is a website to go to. Um, it has all the information in terms of what we've done to date, um, in starting with the action plan which we developed right after the discovery, which included work in terms of developing methods uh, that would work in various matrices, um, you know, filling in uh, data gaps in, 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 the, in toxicity mitigation, uh, and so on. So all that information is on that website. <coughs> so the first thing we did, of course, is do surveys. Um, as we do for any contaminant of the day, we want to be able to see how much of it is in the food, what, exp what is the exposure to consumers. Um, so um, we conducted an extensive survey uh, of levels in food. Uh, the FDA database right now published on the website consists of about 2,600 samples. We have uh, an additional 11 or 1,200 samples, which uh, we're in the process of uh, QCing uh, to be able to post uh, on the website. And the foods uh, analyzed were individual foods collected from the market, but we also added acrylamide to the total diet study. The TDS study, as you know, is uh, an ongoing uh, survey of <coughs> a number of um, uh, contaminants, nutrients, and, and uh, a few hundred pesticides. Four market baskets around the country, uh, three cities per market basket, and about 280 foods uh, that are common in the U.S. diet. So every time something like this hits, uh, we just add that analyte to the uh, list of chemicals to be tested for. We've done it in the past for dioxins, uh, PCB-like compounds, uh, for perchlorate, et cetera. So um, exposure assessment. Mike, you will be proud, one significant figure here. <laughs> done uh, by Mike. Didn't change. <laughs> Didn't change. <laughs> Mike did it three times, 2003, 2004, 2006. It was 0.4 micrograms per kilogram body weight per day, age <laughs> two plus. And as Mike also pointed out, it was generally consistent with international findings. Other bodies were doing 
exposure assessment, and the numbers were more or less in the same um, ballpark. So we felt that in 2006 we had uh, collected enough samples, so we stopped sampling. Um, as I said, though, we, we uh, as I will talk about in a minute, we did um, do another survey to see if there has been or s some of the same products, actually, to see if there have been changes in uh, the levels of uh, acrylamide that we saw back in the 2000 and 2006 uh, time period. Uh, Mike spoke about an exposure assessment using those new data. Um, again, it didn't change much. Um, but nonetheless, these are, back then when it was done, the top 20 foods by mean acrylamide intake. Um, these are the top 20 products, foods rather, and uh, as you can see, the top 20, as Mike said, also said, account for 90% um, of the mean intake. And just the top five alone, or top six um, alone, account for about 60% of the intake. So, as I mentioned, uh, we stopped sampling in 2006. Uh, we felt we had a, a robust database. Now we did additional sampling in 2011 and 2012, about 1,300 samples. Um, as I said, we're QCing them in order to be able to post the data. Um, and uh, the intent was here to identify changes in levels and trends um, in terms of overall exposure. Not much change, but uh, we'll also be looking at specific food products uh, to see if there's been a dent. Because our visits, site visits to industry, in some instances showed really, really significant reductions in acrylamide. We also intend to sample after the FDA guidance is implemented. Uh, I'll talk about the guidance in a minute. But uh, what we want to do is, you know, four or five years down the line, when the guidance is final and implemented, we'll do another survey to see if there is a downward shift in the levels we find in foods. Um, in, I might mention, uh, in case you don't know, our food additive safety, Office, Office of Food Additive Safety recently finalized consultations. Of us, by the way, is headed up by Don, uh, Dennis Kefir, who's sitting in the front. Uh, six potato varieties uh, from JR Simplot. They were engineered to reduce black spot formation, I think, but they were also engineered to reduce sugar levels as well as asparagine levels. So depending on the market penetration of these products, uh, we could potentially see significant reductions in um, acrylamide in fries and chips. Um, in terms of what others have done, um, Health Canada um, in 2009, uh, in, implemented a, a chromide uh, monitoring program to assess if practices that are followed by industry are making a difference. They also did it in 2013. They did a call for data on mitigation measures. Um, I haven't seen the final outcome from that exercise. The European Commission uh, in 2007 recommended, uh, and again in 2010, recommended that member countries monitor for acrylamide in foods. The data have been collated by EFSA. The EFSA did a report in 2007 and 2008. And again, they did a trend analysis between 2007 and 2010. Basically, the conclusion was there wasn't much of a difference as has been pointed out, and that additional risk management um, activities should be done. So in 2011, the European Commission recommended that states should investigate uh, when levels uh, are above certain indicative, as they called it, indicative values. Um, to just give you some examples, French fries, the indicative value is 600 micrograms per kilogram, potato chips, uh, 1,000, soft bread, 150, breakfast cereal, 400, biscuits, crackers, etc., 500. And so the notion is that if uh, Authorities in those states find levels that are higher than these indicative values. They would work with the manufacturer, look at their hazard plans, etc., to see if they have control measures for uh, acrylamide formation. Um, so moving on to JECFA assessment, JECFA actually assessed 
acromomide twice. The, the first one was in 2005. Um, they estimated a margin of exposure of 300 for the general population uh, and a margin of exposure of 75 for high consumers. And um, they concluded that acromide may be a human health concern. Some of the recommendations that came out of that assessment uh, reevaluate when uh, new carcinogenic neurotoxicity data are available. At the time, uh, a major study was underway at NCTR, um, and then the other recommendation, continue work on mitigation and toxicological modeling, and then obtain data on acrylamide in foods uh, from developing countries. They did the assessment again in 2010, uh, this time using the NCTR um, NTP carcinogenicity data that I just alluded to. Uh, the data were actually made available to JECVA ahead of uh, general publication. Again, uh, similar margins as in JECVA 2005, uh, 375 this time. They had 310 for general consumers and 78 for high uh, consumers. And, and so similar conclusion that it is a human health concern. So on mitigation, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's been a lot of international industry and academic work here. Um, the outcomes from this have been uh, the CIA toolbox. CIAA is the Confederation of Foods and Drinks Industry in Europe, sort of the equivalent to our GMA. And uh, they have also done a lot of pamphlets around products, specific products, translated into many languages in Europe. And there have been multiple revisions of the CIA toolbox. Um, in fact, I think the last uh, toolbox, the revision GMA here was also inv involved. Um, Codex Alimentarius Code of Practice was another result for the reduction of acrylamide in foods. The US and the UK co-led the electronic working group and the Codex Committee for Contaminants in foods on that. Um, both are similar in that they address agro agronomy, uh, raw products, as well as processing um, of foods and ingredients that are added um, to foods to, to reduce acrylamide levels. We also uh, have done guidance for industry. It's in draft right now, and our plan is to finalize it this year. We first, in 2009, uh, had a call for data, um, basically asking what uh, firms were using to reduce acrylamide levels. And um, we also asked if we should have levels for specific, specific products. Um, we did get quite a bit of comments and responses that for call for data. And so um, in November 2013, we issued uh, our draft guidance for industry. Um, it, it is sort of structured, it has first general considerations, and then it addresses potato-based foods, uh, raw materials, in terms of um, sourcing potatoes, for example, with low sugar, so low asparagin, um, storage conditions for potatoes, uh, what temperatures they should be stored at, french fries in terms of cutting them to uh, lower the surface area to um, volume ratio, uh, and for fabricated potato products, various things they can add, like calcium salts and acidulants to reduce acrylamide levels. It also has a section uh, for cereal-based foods. Again, it reduces raw material sourcing, processing, and ingredients. For other foods, really, that means just coffee, because as we know, coffee does have acrylamide in it. And we uh, presented a number of studies that seem to indicate that mitigation in coffee is possible, but none to our mind were proven, so we didn't have specific recommendations for coffee. And then preparation and cooking instructions on packaged foods, uh, frozen french fries, um, and then information for the food service uh, operations, uh, such as McDonald's, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> so in general, the draft guidance provides information to help growers, manufacturers, and food service operators to reduce acrylamide in certain foods is intended to suggest a range of possible approaches to acrylamide reduction 
and not to identify specific recommended ap approaches. It does not identify any specific maximum recommended levels or actions, um, such as one done by the EC. Uh, a lot of the comments we received and our own observation when we decide physics was it's very difficult to predict um, acromide levels. You can use the same variety of potato, for example, using the same process. Um, we will get different results on, on different days, um, different parts of the season, etc. So we didn't feel at the time we issued the draft that um, maximum levels uh, were feasible. We, in terms of mitigation, we've also done um, consumer advice. Um, we updated the questions and answers on acrylamide in May 2008 based on uh, studies that were done that was led actually by Lauren Jackson, who's here in the audience uh, at our Division of Food Processing Science and Technology, uh, to what used to be called the National Center for Food Safety and Technology, it's IFISH now, Institute for Food Safety and Health. We conducted CIFSAN focus groups on what message will work. Um, and so we added to the Q's and A's additional information on acrylamide diet and food storage and preparation, which offers advice for consumers who want to reduce acrylamide levels in their diet. Um, so the FDA consumer advice identifies foods and cooking methods associated with acrylamide, suggests consumers who want to make dietary changes focus on food high in saturated fats, trans fats. This is sort of the standard advice we give uh, when faced with different contaminants. Also recommends against uh, reducing intake of healthful grains. For potatoes, uh, it reviews storage pre-cooking treatments such as soaking, cooking methods, cooking endpoints, uh, for toast, uh, cooking endpoint. And this is actually from the consumer advice. Uh, so cut potato products golden yellow color as opposed to brown, toast light brown color as opposed to dark brown. There were numbers associated with this actually, which I felt were very dramatic and drove the point home. Um, but for some reason, the focus groups didn't think the numbers meant much, so <laughs> they were taken out. So we're just relying on the, uh, uh, the color endpoints. So moving on to Furan, um, we've done less work here than, than uh, with acrylamide. Um, it is, uh, Furan is a concern because it's listed in the NTP report on carcinogens as a reason really anticipated to be a human carcinogen. As Mike pointed out, discovered by FDA scientists in 2004, not for the first time necessarily, but that it occurs in foods more commonly than previously thought. Um, and f you know, formation results from, from traditional heat treatment techniques, again like ochromides such as uh, retorting foods in cans and jars, um, and unlike acrylamide, there appear to be multiple mechanisms of formation, um, uh, oxidation of polyunsaturated fatty acids uh, at high temperatures, decomposition of ascorbic acid derivatives, um, degradation of amino acids with uh, or without reducing sugars present, uh, degradation of carbohydrates such as hexose or pentose, thermal degradation of ascorbic acid derivatives, so multiple mechanisms uh, leading to furan formation, which again makes uh, mitigation a challenge. So we held a food advisory committee meeting back in 2004. Uh, actually, uh, our colleagues from Health Canada participated in the meeting because we had previously discussed about collaborating. And so we sort of split it up the samples we'll be looking at, and they focus more on mechanisms of formation. We also, again, published requests for data, as we do always, um, and issued consumer messages and uh, questions and answers. At the time, it was based on what we knew, FDS preliminary exposure data suggests that the levels of furan being found in food are well below levels that would cause harmful effects until more is known, again, uh, the same consumer message in terms of eating um, a balanced diet consistent with U.S. dietary guidelines. Uh, you can find all our activities on that website. Uh, 
at the top. Um, like Acroyomide, we had developed an action plan, um, developed a method that has pretty good sensitivity. You see that uh, low uh, LOD, LOQ of 0.2 to 0.6 for water uh, liquids, and then it, a little higher for solid foods. We sampled a wide variety of foods for Furan and posted the data on the website. Uh, we worked with TTB to prepare data on Furan and alcoholic beverages, prepared exposure assessments for Furan, again, done mo most likely by um, the great Mike. <laughs> uh, so adults two plus years mean 0.26, uh, two significant figures. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, 90th percentile, 0.61, and then for infants, mean was 0.41, 90th percentile, 0.99 microgram per kilogram body weight per day, and infants just from formula was 0.9 micrograms per kilogram day based on infant caloric requirements. Do you want to explain that? <laughs> I did that on purpose, I was just telling you that. Uh, okay. It's a little inside joke for me. <laughs> So here are the top contributors. Brewed coffee by far uh, is uh, the biggest here. Uh, you see the you know, order. Um, you, you get down to canned tuna, water packed, and it's, it's uh, way, way below what uh, is in coffee. So if you're on, uh, in Codex, um, JECFA evaluated in 2010. Margin of exposure, 964 mean and uh, 480 for high dietary, um, and 480 for high dietary exposure. And the Codex Committee on Contaminants in Foods um, looked into whether we could do a code of practice as we did for acrylamide. We actually led the development of the discussion paper that was discussed at that committee. And the conclusion was that we don't have enough um, in terms of mitigation to be able to develop a code of practice. Uh, and then lastly, MCPD and glycidyl esters. Um, this is more recent compared to acrylamide and furan. Uh, formed during thermal processing or refining of edible oils and can produce um, MCPD uh, esters and glycidyl esters. This actually initially were thought Perhaps you know they're not bioavailable, but more and more studies are showing that in fact um, the esters are cleaved and it's pretty much uh, entirely bioavailable. So 3-MCPD uh, is a rodent carcinogen. Uh, it has a JECFA TDI of two micrograms per kilogram body weight per day. Um, glycidol, genotoxic mutagen, animal carcinogen, according to IARC, and reasonably anticipated to be a human carcinogen according to uh, NTP, and probably carcinogenic to humans, IARC. To MCPD, uh, there's limited toxicological information. No maximum total daily intake has been um, set for that. <laughs> so for a long time, when this was discovered around 2007, method was a, a challenge. Uh, there weren't you know, good, reliable analytical methods for these compounds. Uh, but more recently, uh, Sean McMahon and his collaborators in our Office of Regulatory Science developed a very good uh, validated method that has been published. Um, you see there, it is a solid phase extraction, LCMS, MS, electrospray ionization method. And using that method, They've done a, a mini survey uh, of 116 or so retail and industrial samples uh, from 25 different plant and animal sources. Um, partial results are shown in the table. The high levels of refined oils versus unrefined, um, and the highest levels seem to be in palm oils. And um, you know some infant formula Make us do use palm oils, and we have, you know, started to look at oils from those plants to see what the levels of 3-MCPD um, and glycidyl esters are. Uh, in terms of next steps, um, 
we want to conduct a safety assessment for these esters in refined oils to inform any risk management decisions uh, we may need to make. Um, and glycidyl and 3-MCPD esters are on the JECFA priority list of contaminants and naturally occurring toxicants. Um, this year, the JECFA meeting, I think, is devoted to mycotoxins, Mike, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so the earliest this assessment would be done by JECFA would be next year. Um, in terms of uh, what other countries have done on this, uh, there's activity around the world on these. Um, uh, Food Standards Australia and New Zealand and the UK FSA uh, are gearing up to do surveys in infant formula. The European Commission has uh, recommended member states collect data of levels in foods. Um, they have also done validation of analytical method uh, with the Joint Research Center, um, and the Research Center is supposed to also do a survey of these esters in foods, which EFSA then will use. Um, the plan was this year to do a, a risk assessment for these compounds. Uh, Health Canada has done surveys in 2011 and 2013, and, and they're planning to update their dietary exposure uh, estimate uh, to these compounds. And um, Japanese uh, colleagues from the um, Food Safety Commission of Japan have informed me that they have completed a 13-week toxicity and metabolism studies, uh, which I presume they will make available to JECFA when that assessment is finally done. And with that, I think that's the last slide. Thank you for your attention.